In this video, we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 23. This is our studies uh, through the book of Jeremiah. Now, with this uh, particular chapter, uh, I wrestled with this a little bit because I was tempted to do it in two parts. It's quite long, it's about, uh, at least relatively to the ones we've been looking at. It's about 40 verses. And also, there's more or less two distinct uh, subjects uh, in this uh, chapter. And towards the end of the second section, uh, it, revolt, it sort of uh, would require or involve uh, some detailed explanation in order to understand it. But we'll see that when we go on. <clears throat> so it's going to take a little time. So, But I think I'll just plow through it and whatever time it takes to get through it, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do it. Um, I like to keep these videos short if I can. Not more than 30 minutes, but this one will surely go somewhat longer. So just bear with me on this one and we'll we'll get through it. And I'm, it's a wonderful chapter, actually. Uh, there's lots in it. And that's the other reason why I want to take it a little on the slow side. So I said that there was two basic main sections here, which really could be two separate chapters. Uh, the first section is uh, chapter 23, starts with the first one, of course, and runs right down to the end of verse 8. And that's dealing with the false shepherds, the false rulers and leaders of Israel. The Lord sort of hauls them out on the carpet, and we'll look at that. And then verse 9 to the end of the chapter, it's a long section, uh, looks at the false prophets. <clears throat> the false prophets are a reoccurring theme in uh, Jeremiah. He was surrounded by them. Uh, he was like a lone voice. Now we know there were a few others who were contemporary with Jeremiah, but um, uh, for the most part uh, he was uh, surrounded by these uh, false prophets who attacked him and who were in collusion uh, with the wicked leadership of Israel. So if there is a connection, that's the connection. Uh, between the two sections. Uh, the false prophets were supporters of the uh, wicked shepherds who ruled Israel. So uh, starting verse 1, woe uh, to the shepherds. Now this is sort of a continuation from chapter 22. Remember uh, from chapter 22 we looked at five uh, kings of Judah who were wicked uh, just leading up to the final you know captivity. Um, I won't list them all off again, uh, but you can find them in chapter 22. And they were all sons of godly Josiah, and one was a, a grandson of Josiah. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they resisted the words of Jeremiah, who constantly told them to surrender to the Babylonians. Don't make leagues or covenants with Egypt. Uh, uh, don't plot against Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, just simply surrender. That's God's will for you because he's going to destroy this city and you'll spare your life if you surrender. But they would uh, always reject uh, Jeremiah's uh, predictions and his counsel. So it says here, woe, woe to the shepherds. And, and again, I believe it's referring not well specifically to the five that were just mentioned, but we can trace right back all the ungodly kings and their rulers and leaders the whole class, really, like the the leadership of Judah. So we see actually uh, the kings and, and and the and the prophets and the the priests. All three actually are mentioned within this whole chapter, and uh, they're warned by the Lord here, chastised. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. Uh, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not attended to them. Uh, behold, I will attend uh, to you uh, for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall have uh, have be, they shall be fruitful rather and increase. Now, uh, we get several things here. Uh, first of all, uh, that God would 
look after his own sheep. And I believe here that there's a, a prophecy. The prophecy starts uh, really in verse 4 and runs down to the end of verse 6. We'll look at that. Uh, that extends beyond even our own time to a future time when God will restore uh, the Jewish people from captivity and subservience to the Gentiles and will work among them. Now with verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Now we can see a similar prophecy to this in uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 26. Um, we'll start in verse 24. Therefore the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you, that is the people of Israel, and thoroughly purge you. Now this has not yet happened. Uh, purge away your dross and take away your uh, alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you should be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Well, this has not been fulfilled yet. So it's predicting a time in the future, we believe the millennial kingdom, when the Lord will restore righteous and godly rulers in the land of Israel. And there, there's some intimation of that also in Ezekiel, the latter chapters of Ezekiel, of their rulers. As uh, they had been in the beginning, you know, they had great leaders in the beginning. You know, think of Moses and uh, Joshua and some of the judges that were raised up later when they had fallen into the sin and so on. So we come back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. So this is what uh, Jeremiah is predicting here. Uh, he's predicting um, this uh, restoration of uh, leaders, of true shepherds over them. You know, what we have here, and I said there was a second thing, uh, like this, the, the shepherds, um, we get this also... Uh, in several passages of the of the prophets, several prophets speak of this, especially Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 34, we get the same thing. If you look at Ezekiel chapter uh, 34, basically uh, from verse 1 right down through, uh, he speaks of the shepherds, you know, the word of the Lord came to me, verse 1, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, uh, but you do not feed the flock. Essentially, they were fleecing the flock. So where uh, the uh, in Jeremiah's prophecy, the shepherds were not caring for the sheep, uh, that they were scattered and dispersed and didn't seek after them. Here, uh, initially, uh, the the condemnation is that they fleeced the sheep, took from them, and gave nothing in return. But there's a prophecy uh, in this chapter of Ezekiel 34, verse 23. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David. Now, King David had been dead for many hundreds of years. Uh, we believe that the David here is actually the son of David. Now, some believe that David will be raised from the dead and he'll be the prince regent over Israel during the millennium. That's possible. My personal opinion is that uh, it's, it's a prophetic reference to the son of David, the true shepherd, because we're talking about that. You know, when the Lord Jesus came, he said, I am I am the good shepherd. I'm, he was the true shepherd of the sheep who gave his life for the sheep. He didn't. Uh, he wasn't a hireling. Uh, when the wolf came, he didn't. He didn't flee. He was the one true shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. Well, in the millennial kingdom, he will still be that uh, true shepherd of the house of Israel. On the earth, he was leading his sheep out of the Jewish enclosure, and he said, "Other sheep I have, that them also I will call." That's the Gentile sheep, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. That's our current time now. Uh, when a Jewish person believes in Christ, uh, he's no longer a Jew. When a Gentile believes in Christ, in a sense, he's no longer a Gentile. We're uh, members of the one body, the church. 
but there's a future time when uh, he will be specifically the shepherd of the people of Israel again. So we see in verse 24 of Ezekiel, we're still in Ezekiel, I the Lord will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them. I the Lord have spoken. There's a lot in there and there's some different views on it, but uh, I just give you my, uh, my, uh, my opinion on it. And, uh, but everyone has to weigh the word, uh, be good Bereans. So let's go back. The reason why I mentioned that in Ezekiel, because we're dealing with the same idea. And here is the second part of this prophecy is uh, verse five. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. Okay, so from the, the lineage of David would come one. Now, this is a messianic prophecy. This is predicting uh, Christ, the coming of Christ but not so much in his earthly ministry and his work on the cross, per se, but what will happen in the future. So he's a branch of righteousness. He dis, he's, a, he's a descendant. Okay, that branch, we get that branch mentioned several times. I'm not going to refer to all the, the passages. I won't look at them at the same time, but I'll give you the references. If you want them, you can write them down, where we get this idea of Messiah being the branch. That is Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2 uh, Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 6 verse 12 and then Jeremiah the same Jeremiah here uh, that we're looking at verse uh, chapter 23 verse 5 to 6 there's also a reference in Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 15 I believe but uh, so here we get the prophecy and he's a king who will reign and prosper execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. You know, when the Lord Jesus came, he was the son of David. He was the king of Israel. Uh, he was rejected by his people. They said, we will not have this man to uh, reign over us. And he was crucified, but he was crucified as the king of Israel. Remember on his cross, uh, Pilate wrote, uh, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So he was crucified. He was executed by Rome for the crime of being the king of the Jews. And the Jewish religious leaders said, no, oh, no, no, Pilate, don't write that he's the king of the Jews. Write that he said he's the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, what I have written, I have written. So the Lord was condemned for who he exactly was, the king of the Jews. Now he, he's, you know, still king, but he's reigning at the right hand of God, seated until his enemies made his footstool. You know, Psalm 110, Hebrews chapter 10. So the Lord is waiting. He's not taking his great power. He's not exercising that power as king. You know, time is rolling on. Another thing is happening. He's calling out from among the Gentiles mostly, but also a few Jewish people, and being brought into the church. When the Lord appears in glory, then his kingdom will be established over the earth. There is a kingdom presently, and we are in that kingdom uh, the kingdom of the son of his love, you know, peace, righteous peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But it's not visible. It's not in power in the world yet. But we're part of it. And so verse 6 says, in his days, Judah will be saved. It says in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. And Israel shall dwell safely. You know, now, presently, they've been called back to the land, but they're there in unbelief. And Antichrist is going to come, claiming that he is their Messiah, and many of them will accept that. Now, this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. Now, the, the Hebrew is Jehovah, or Yahweh, uh, Sidkenu, Righteousness. Yahweh, Jehovah, our Righteousness. Now, that's based on his work on the cross. Because uh, Christ died on the cross as a substitute for sinners. You know, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, it says, Christ is made unto us righteousness. So he is our righteousness. He, the one who bore our sins on the cross on the earth now has been raised from among the dead. Therefore, we've been justified. That means reckoned righteous in him. And he now in glory is our subsisting righteousness. He is that now. Well, for these Jewish people who repent 
during the Great Tribulation and turn to him and coming into the millennium, they will confess too at that time, uh, Jehovah or Yahweh, our righteousness, because it will all be based on Christ's work, no matter uh, the, the, the dispensation or the time. So we just finished this section off on the shepherds. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the north country and from all the countries where I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Now, this is important. Uh, to understand because some say that this was all fulfilled <clears throat> when the, you know, after what Jeremiah had, had been predicting about the captivity by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and they were there for 70 years, and we read, you know, in Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah, that this, there was a remnant raised up in Babylon and then in Persia, in Persia, the kingdom of Persia, and were brought back after 70 years of captivity, and they built the, sec the second temple, which eventually became Herod's temple. They built the second temple. And, and some believe this was the uh, ultimate fulfillment of that, what he's speaking of, this, this bringing them back from captivity. But at the very most, we can say that this is only a partial fulfillment because there, there's double fulfillments of prophecy. This is a principle. But uh, it can only be a, a partial fulfillment. And this is what I, I, was, I was saying um, uh, about what we had in verse 3. But I will gather the remnant of my flock of all countries. I have driven them and bring them back to their folds. Because he's speaking about uh, David as, as the righteous branch who will reign over them as a king over the earth. That's not happening now. Uh, the Lord Jesus is not the king of Israel reigning over them right now. They're in total unbelief. And in his days, Judah will be saved. Well, they're not saved now. You know, they're in unbelief. And another uh, thing that is a hint uh, to show us that this was not fulfilled in the return of the remnant, but has a future full return uh, fulfillment. You know, during the tribulation, the Jewish people will be scattered. We read this in Revelation and the Old Testament prophets. And then, you know, the Lord will come and they will be gathered back to their land. We get that in Matthew 24 from every uh, corner of the earth uh, from uh, the heavens from all four corners of the heavens, the sound of the trumpet, and they will be gathered back. But an indicator here is uh, this, where it says, as the Lord lives, verse 7, who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. Uh, it, they will no longer say that. In other words, this captivity uh, will be so, uh, th rather, this uh, return from captivity, this deliverance, this future restoration, will be so great that the uh, the exodus, the deliverance from captivity in Egypt, you know, under Moses, will pale in significance. Let's just read it again. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought the children of Israel up from the land of Egypt. You know, the exodus, the return, the, the deliverance from Egypt is the great point for the Jewish people. You know, the, the Passover every year is a reminder of that bondage. And so uh, even the return of the uh, from Babylon was nothing compared to this, or even their present-day return of the nations in unbelief. As marvelous and miraculous in many ways that it is, it's still not the fulfillment of this, right? Because uh, Egypt is the big one, but it will pale in significance to this one. This is yet future. And we again, if you look at verse 5 and 6, that will confirm that. None of this has been fulfilled yet. Jeremiah's a pop prophet, remember, okay? We're not preterists. We're not trying to have all the scriptures fulfilled sometime in the past. There's still lots to be fulfilled yet all accomplished through Christ, for sure. Okay, so that sort of uh, uh, concludes uh, this section. Now uh, we come into the section, verse 9, to the end of the chapter, verse 40, dealing with the uh, false prophets. Now some of this I can read through and sort of breeze, breeze through it uh, fairly quickly, and I'll make brief comments as I go, but when we get further on into it, I'll have to stop and uh, give some explanations. 
So verse 9, uh, my heart within me is broken because of the, of the prophets and all my bones shake. This is Jeremiah speaking. These false prophets drove Jeremiah crazy. But not only that, if I can put it that way, but not only that, uh, they were bringing judgment upon themselves. And this is how this uh, second section develops. And, and we'll see. Uh, he says, in the heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man. And like a man who wine has overcome, you know, he's disoriented, you know, and uh, staggering about. He's not literally drunk here, but just it's a metaphor to show how rattled Jeremiah was by all the false prophets around him. That's the thing you see with Jeremiah is that he, he's, he was a man that had a heart, right? This was just not academic for him. It was real for him. Excuse me. Uh, it was real for him, and he had a heart, and he was really in it, and he was really in those circumstances. And so we go on, verse 10, For the land is full of adulterers, for because of a curse the land mourns, uh, the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, their course of life is evil, and their might is not, and their might is not right. That's an interesting expression right there. Their might is not right. You know, uh, they think might is right because they had the power. You know, they believed in the golden rule. Whoever had the golden rules, you know. Uh, verse 11, for both prophet and priest are profane. That means ungodly. So we see the shepherds, uh, the, the kings, the leaders of Israel, uh, the prophets and the priests, these three uh, groups, uh, were false shepherds and they're profane ungodly yes in my house i have found their wickedness says the lord so you know it starts out with jeremiah and so jeremiah's words now are blending into the words of the lord he's so he's a prophet so he's speaking from his heart but now it's it's jehovah it's yahweh himself speaking yes in my house i have found their wickedness says the lord Therefore, their way shall, uh, therefore, their way shall be to them like slippery ways. In the darkness, they shall be driven on and fall in them. For I will bring disaster on them uh, the year the year of their punishment, says the Lord. Now, this is uh, the Lord's not speaking here of eternal punishment that will come. And that's a solemn thing after death. You know, there will be the final judgment. But he's speaking of a temporal judgment that they'll be killed probably uh, in the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city. Verse 13, And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied by Baal, the false god Baal, and caused my people to, to err. Now Samaria, the false prophets of Samaria, they led the people in the north astray. And Assyria came and took them all captive into Assyria. That had already happened 100 years before this. And basically what the Lord is saying, the same thing that happened to them is going to happen to you. So verse 14, also, I've seen a horrible thing in the prophets of Jerusalem. They commit adultery and walk in lies. So they were morally corrupt. They also strengthen the hand of evildoers. Instead of speaking truth to power, that the Old Testament prophets were supposed to do. They were supposed to correct the, the king of Israel, you know, like Elijah did, speaking to Ahab and so on, and other prophets. <clears throat> uh, they didn't do that. They were in collusion. They were like court prophets. They told the kings what the, they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. Um, and so uh, the result of this... Uh, so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me and the inhabitants of Gomorrah. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. It was destroyed uh, with uh, judgment of fire and wiped out uh, for their sin. Well, uh, the Lord is saying here, the same thing is going to happen to Judah. Um, and then we go on, verse 15, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets. So we're continuing on now with the prophets. Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, make them drink uh, the water of gall. For uh, from the prophets of Jerusalem, profaneness, profaneness or pollution, can be translated that way, 
has gone out into all the land. So they uh, don't only prophesied lies, they were also promoters of moral corruption <clears throat> for the people. Instead of being leaders of the people, uh, they corrupted them. Verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts. You know, I should just say, by the way, uh, this, this is really what we see today, you know, people who uh, want political power very badly, they'll sell their souls. They'll, they'll say what uh, needs to be said in order to get that place of power and override all truth and righteousness. They'll speak what they know to be false, uh, if that in any way puts them in a position of power. Uh, and that's just in the political realm. That's why Christians should be very wary of that, you know, uh, because they they will be corrupted too if they collude with it. And and this is with Israel, uh, the prophets there were to speak truth to the uh, political powers of the time uh, because their system was different. It was a theocratic system. Uh, the church is not a theocracy. Uh, we're, a we're a remnant called out. We're an organism, a body. We're heavenly. Our citizenship is in the heavens. Okay, this uh, this is a big topic, so I better shut up now and continue on with the with the words here of Jeremiah. Uh, verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. Now he's turning to the people and telling them, don't listen to these guys. Uh, they make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. Now, I want you to keep this verse in mind because when we come down to verses 33 to 39, where we're going to have to spend a little time on that section because there's some Hebrew word play in it. This is important that they speak not the words that come from the Lord, but they speak from their own heart. It comes from themselves. These false prophets. And that's important. It's a vision of their own of their own heart. In contrast to the Lord, we get in verse 20, if you want to drop down to verse 20, the anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. So you see that contrast there? The false prophets were speaking the vision of their own heart. But the true prophets of God and the Lord through them was speaking the thoughts of his heart. So we get that that contrast. So let's just run down from verse 17 on down. They continually say to me, those who despise me, uh, uh, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. Uh, the false prophets, this is one of the things they kept repeating. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were not going to destroy the city. You will have peace. That was their message. That's what the kings wanted to hear. That's what, you know, we, we, we saw them earlier in the last chapter, Paniah and Jehoiakim and Shalom and Je all of these fellows. They, uh, they wanted to hear that. And so the prophets told them that. They told them what they wanted to hear. Um, and they said, peace, 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 when there was no peace. We get that also in Jeremiah. Um, and everyone to who walks according to the, the dictates of his own heart, and we get the heart again, they shall say, no evil shall come upon you. you know, the, the rulers were not walking according to God's word. The kings of Israel were supposed to walk according to God's word, but, word, but they were walking according to the dictates of their own heart. And therefore, the false prophets prophesied things from their own heart, for their own purposes, for financial gain, for, or for positions of power. But the true prophet of God, like Jeremiah and others, uh, uh, spoke the truth. And it would come to pass, verse 20, until he is executed and performed the thought of his heart. Look at verse 19. Behold, uh, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind, and it will fall violently on the head of the wicked. Again, he's speaking here of the coming of the Babylonian, the Chaldeans army, who would raise uh, Jerusalem to the ground. Now, notice the end of verse 20. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. 
<laughs> I like that because, you know, you, you, you're not getting it right now, but you will get it. You're not understanding my words through Jeremiah now, but you will understand. Now, we can say some of them, perhaps, who survived uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and ended up in Babylon. And after they were there for 10 or 15 years, probably, you know, talked among themselves. Yep, Jeremiah was right. Uh, we understand it perfectly now. But I believe the, the, the wording here may even speak again uh, to a further day. Because Israel as a whole is still in judicial blindness. This comes out in Romans chapter 11. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says a veil is passed over their eyes. So when they read the prophets, when they read Moses, they don't see Christ. So they're still in blindness and darkness. But that veil will be lifted. And God will remove that season. It's just for a season, it says in Romans 11. It's not permanent. God is not done with Israel. And then uh, they will understand it perfectly. So let's continue on. Verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from their evil doings. You know, if they had been real prophets... They would have told the people, we have to repent. We have to return to the Lord. We have to stop uh, committing adultery and doing wickedness and uh, stop worship, worshiping idols. And, and they should have shown it in their, the false prophets should have shown it uh, uh, in their own lives. They should have modeled it themselves and the people would turn and God would have uh, blessed them and delivered them. Uh, and I love verse 23 and 24. It's a real gem. It's a real gem. You can, this is one you can put on a, on a plaque and put it on your wall. You don't have to be a Jew. <laughs> you don't have to be a Jewish part of the Jewish remnant to appreciate this. Verse 23. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So he says, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God far off? What the Lord is saying, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He fills heaven and earth. He sees everything. I like that because, you know, Paul sort of uh, alludes a bit to this. Uh, actually, in, in Romans chapter 10, actually he alludes to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. But this these verses have the same idea. He says uh, there uh, about uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, uh, becoming a Christian, receiving the gift of eternal life. It's not something hard. Paul says in Romans 10, you don't have to climb up into heaven. You know, you don't have to do penten, uh, penance and, you know, count beads, do good works. And, and you don't have to go down into the abyss, humble yourself down into hell. He says, no, he says, salvation is near you, even as near as your lips, you know. He's not far away from any of us. And if you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that God has raised him from the dead, has died for you and raised him from the dead, believe in your heart and confess him with your mouth. You shall be saved. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter uh, chapter uh, 10, I think verses 9 and 10. You can look it up later. So this is essentially what he's saying here. He doesn't mention salvation here. But he's just uh, showing that, you know, it's not a big thing. If you turn to me, I will hear you. I will act. You know, I will deliver you. Verse 25. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name. I have, dream uh, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. This is what the false prophets were saying. I have dreamed. I have dreamed. Uh, how long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? You know, the prophets had a dream. That's all it was, just a dream. Uh, indeed, they are prophets of deceit of their own heart who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. You know, earlier, especially with the northern tribes, they had, uh, had worshipped Baal. And uh, they were very evangelical about it too. And this is what the Lord is saying, you know, uh, they're not telling my people about me. They're telling my people about Baal, telling their neighbors. Verse 28, uh, the prophet has a dream to tell. And he who has my word 
let him speak it faithfully. Now, here uh, the Lord is saying, uh, ones like Jeremiah, you know, who really has a dream, let him tell a dream and let him speak the word faithfully. But then we get a comparison at the end of verse 28. What is, is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? It's a comparison. Notice verse 29. Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? There he's describing ones like Jeremiah as, as, a, as a fire, like his word was like a fire, the true prophecy. Uh, and his word was like a hammer that is power to break the rock in pieces. And just in verse 28, uh, the, it's, it's the wheat. In other words, the false prophets compared to the prophets, the true prophecy of the Lord was like comparing chaff to wheat. There was no comparison, comparison, uh, a comparison to it. Uh, compared to the Lord's prophets, the prophecies, uh, the, their prophecies were as chaff, because the Lord was like was like a hammer, was like a like a fire. And then verse thirty. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They steal the, the Lord's words. They don't hear the true message uh, because of the false prophets. Behold, I'm against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and, and say, he says, you see, they say, he says, they pretend they're speaking in the name of the Lord. Behold, I am against those uh, who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or, or command them. Uh, therefore, uh, they shall not profit this people at all, uh, says the Lord. Okay. Uh, now, this is, this is important here. Uh, we should uh, take this to heart. You know, when he says in verse 31, the false prophets with their tongues say, he says, he says. Uh, and as we get down from verse 33 to verse 40, uh, he speaks of uh, these false prophets and, and their oracles and how they speak of the oracle of God and so on uh, and how they speak uh, their prophecies, their supposed prophecy. You know, um, sometimes as Christians, the way we speak is important. And, and again, I'll bring this out more when we get down to verse 33. But sometimes we'll say, God told me this. Or, I feel led of the Lord to do this. Now, sometimes it may be the Lord leading you. But I think we should be cautious uh, with our words. Is it really God telling you? Uh, is it really God leading you? Now, I don't want to throw you into doubt uh, about the leading of the Lord. But we should be very cautious with our words. He says, he said this to me. I'm saying this to you, right? But did he really say that to you? Did he really tell you this? Did he really? So this is, a, I'm just saying this by way of caution, okay? Uh, but these prophets were saying, he says, but they're actually speaking lies and, and doing it recklessly. That's what this translation has, lies. And by their recklessness, I did not send them, verse 32, or command them. Therefore, shall uh, therefore they shall not profit this people at all uh, says the lord now uh, we get in this part verse 33 to verse 39 or 40 we're gonna have to put our thinking caps on a little bit uh, because there's some word play here in the hebrew and i don't know if i can totally explain it to you but we'll we'll, we'll try verse 33 so when these people or the prophet or the priests ask you when these people, the people or when one of the priests or the prophets come uh, to you, that is to Jeremiah, saying, uh, what is the oracle of the Lord? Okay. In your translation, you may have, uh, what is the burden of the Lord? Both are possible translations. Es essentially, uh, it means like a prophecy, a divine inspired word. Uh, I think most of the older translations, like uh, the King James and the Derby translation, 
uh, they use the word uh, uh, burden, which is fine. Uh, here I'm using New King James. It uses the word oracle. Some of the newer translations use oracle. Literally, uh, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word masa, it literally means to lift up. Uh, that's why it's translated burden, like a weight, you know, uh, like something that's heavy and you have to lift it up and you're carrying it around and you're, and you're burdened with it until you uh, drop it, until you let it go. And so that's how the prophecies that were given to the Lord's prophets are described as burdens or oracles, it's burning in their heart. It's like a weight until they until they deliver it until they until they let it go uh, and so this word is used uh, this word um, massa or lifting up or burden oracle is occurs eight times in this section and sometimes it's used uh, in in the way of um, uh, sort of a word play to uh, uh, you know to show the describe the character of these false prophets and what and what they were doing. So if we go on with this, uh, it says, what is the oracle of the Lord? This is what they, they would ask Jeremiah. What, what is the word of the Lord, Jeremiah? What is the, you know, but it's sort of, uh, they're sort of mocking him, you see. Hey, uh, what's up, dude? You know, like, well, you know, what's happening? You got a word for the Lord from us? You know, I think that's the way to understand this as we go through the subsequent verses. And then uh, we get this. Uh, you shall say to them, this is the response that Jeremiah was to give to these, the people and the priests and the false prophets. What oracle? What oracle? I will even forsake you, says the Lord. Now, this expression, what oracle or what burden, uh, can also be translated, you are the burden you are the oracle. Now, if you have the Darby translation, you'll see that. Uh, there's a footnote in the Darby translation that says, you are, ye are, ye plural, are the burden. You are the oracle. You are the weight, okay? Uh, and, and, and I, even I, will forsake you. I'll read it from the Darby translation to the second clause there. I will even cast you off. Uh, what the Lord is saying uh, or telling Jeremiah to tell them, no, you're the weight I'm carrying around. You're the burden. Uh, and, and I'm going to cast you off. I'm going to get rid of this burden. You see, it's sort of a, a bit of a uh, uh, word, I guess, wordplay. I don't know if that's the right way to describe it, but ironic, you know. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to take you, and I'm going to let you go. I'm going to cast you off. Of course, that, that's exactly what what eventually uh, did happen. And then verse 34, and as for the prophet and the priest and the people who say, uh, the oracle or the word of the Lord, I will even punish that man in this house. Now that goes back up to um, when we looked at uh, verse uh, 31, where it says, who use their tongues and says, he says, okay? This was like a, a almost like a, a vain, uh, a, a vain speaking, taking the Lord's name in vain in a way, you know, saying, uh, you know, the oracle of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, the word of the Lord, you know, they would use it in everyday speech. Just like I said, this is dangerous to do. The Lord told me, I feel the Lord let me this, I this, I the, really, and and these false prophets had that habit of doing that. You know, the Lord, this is the word of the Lord. This is the burden of the Lord. And so there, and through the rest of the section, the Lord is chastising them for this, this vain speaking, and saying that they had the word of the Lord. They had the burden of the Lord. Uh, the oracle of the Lord, I will even punish that man in his house. Verse 35, thus every one of you shall say to his neighbor and everyone to his brother, what has the Lord answered and what has the Lord spoken? And, and verse 36, and the oracle of the Lord, uh, you shall mention no more. For every man's word will be his oracle. For you have perverted uh, the words of the living God, uh, the Lord of hosts, our God. Thus you shall say to the prophet, 
What has the Lord answered you? What has the Lord spoken? But since you say the oracle of the Lord or the burden of the Lord, therefore thus says the Lord, because you say this word, the oracle of the Lord. So the Lord's really driving home this point, right? You keep saying the word of the Lord. You keep saying the burden of the Lord, the oracle of the Lord. What has the Lord said? What has the Lord answered? You know, the, basically, the Lord was fed up with them and fed up with the speaking, uh, the speaking of the false of, of the false prophets. It's interesting that Jeremiah himself never uses the word burden when he gives a prophecy in his 50 odd chapters. He never uses the word burden. Now, other prophets do, like uh, Nahum and uh, Malachi, Zechariah, they use the word, the burden of the Lord, the oracle of the Lord. It was, it's a true, you know, Jeremiah always just says, and the word of the Lord came to me. It's a different word in the Hebrew. And I think the reason why um, Jeremiah avoided using the word oracle or burden was because these false prophets who were surrounding him and surrounding the king continually were using this word, right? And he wanted to disassociate himself from this. There's not You can talk about oracle and burden all you want, guys, but God's going to judge you. That's what Jeremiah is saying here. That's what's being talked about here. The oracle of the Lord. And I have sent you saying, do not say uh, the oracle or the burden of the Lord. Verse 38. Do not say it. Do not say it. Verse 39. Uh, you know, I think this is a word to Jeremiah, actually. I have sent you. Do not say it. And then verse 39. Behold, therefore behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and forsake you, or again, uh, cast you off. In other words, uh, as we saw, in verse uh, 33, uh, you are the burden of the Lord. You are the oracle of the Lord. You know, the Lord would unburden himself of these guys. He was going to cast them off. They were going to go into captivity to Babylon. Some of them would be murdered or killed by Nebuchadnezzar himself. So <clears throat> the city I gave you and your fathers and will cast you out of my presence. It's solemn, isn't it? In verse 40, and I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, a perpetual shame, uh, which shall not be forgotten. So the Lord was, was done with this. He never wanted to hear that, that expression again. I have a word, you know, I have a burden. I have an oracle. He's done with it. Uh, and uh, this is quite a solemn, solemn uh, verse. So let's us be careful. When we say, I've got a word for you, you know, the Lord told me to tell you. Let's just be careful with that. We can learn that as Christians. God has spoken in his word. We have the plain written, uh, revealed will of God in his word. We don't have to add to it. And we need to walk humbly before him. And again, I didn't do too bad, uh, 48 minutes. I thought it might even go longer, so I kept it under 50. So we probably should end this here. And again, uh, stress this. Verse 23 and 24, am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and, and not a God afar off? Yes, that's what he's saying. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Remember, he's near you. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if there never has been a time in your life, a, a definite looking to him and looking to see that, yes, I'm a sinner, and I need a savior. So turn to him, confess him. He's not afar off, he's near at hand. He's near as your mouth. May the Lord bless you today, amen.